Today, I'm going to be talking about um, verse 23 of Upadesh Undia. This is, uh, um, well, <clears throat> this is part of a, a sequence of verses. So to understand this in context, we, it's good to go back uh, to the uh, previous, well, the previous couple of verses. In verse 21, that, oh, even further, that, <coughs> that is in verse 19, Bhagavan said that if we, um, but when one investigates oneself uh, within, or when we inwardly investigate, uh, what is the place from which one rises as I, I will die. I here refers to ego. And this is jnana vichara. Jnana vichara means investigation of jnana. Jnana is awareness. So <coughs> jnana is always shining in us as I. So when we investigate the place from which ego rises, the place from which ego rises is from ourself, the pure awareness I am. So this is jnana vichara. And what happens when we investigate ourselves? If we investigate ourselves keenly enough, uh, Bhagavan says in the next verse, in the place where I emerges, oh, oh yes, so, so if we investigate ourselves keenly enough, I will die. So um, in, what happens when I uh, die is when he says, in the place where I emerges, that the one appears spontaneously as I am I. That itself is the whole. So uh, <clears throat> when ego uh, merges back in its source, what appears spontaneously, in other words, what, what alone remains is that uh, is, is the, the fundamental awareness I am, which is always aware of itself, just not as I am this or that. It's nature of ego to be aware of itself as I am this or that. The nature of the pure awareness I am is to be aware of itself as I am I. In other words, I'm only I, I'm nothing, I'm just I, nothing other than I. Nothing other than myself, in other words. Um, that itself is uh, uh, pundram. Pundram means is a Tamil form of the Sanskrit word purna, which means the, the whole or the totality of all that is. In other words, it implies the infinite whole. Um, then in verse 21, he says, referring to what he had said in the previous verse, but uh, 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 that the one appears spontaneously as I am I, and that is the infinite whole. He he then says, um, uh, adunalame. That means that that referring to what he was talking about in the previous as the, the one infinite whole that shines as I am I, that is at all times the substance of the world called I. Podol means substance or the true import, the, the true import or what is signified by the word called I. So what I always refers to is that one fundamental awareness, but we are our, our fundamental awareness of our own existence. In other words, I am. Why is it of all times the, the true import of the word I? Uh, he says, Nanatra um, Tukutum. Uh, and uh, that means because of the exclusion of our non-existence, even in sleep, which is devoid of I. Uh, what do you mean by the exclusion of our non-existence? It, it's a poetic way of saying, because we do not cease to exist, even in sleep, which is devoid of I. When he says it's devoid of I, he means devoid of ego. That is, when ego in, in sleep, ego subsides and dissolves back into its source. But what then remains is the fundamental awareness I am. So since that fundamental awareness I am exists in all three states, in waking, dream, and sleep, it exists alone in sleep. And in waking and dream, it exists mixed with um, mixed with awareness of, of other things. So because we do not Though ego ceases to exist in sleep, though there's actually no ego or mind in sleep, we do not cease to exist. So we in sleep, we remain just a, not as I am this or I am that, that is ego. We exist just as I am. So even in waking and dream, when we're aware of ourselves as I am this, 
we are still aware of ourselves as I am. That is the fundamental awareness I am is uh, the background, uh, is the ever existing substratum or background to all experience. Whatever else we may experience or not experience, we are always aware I am. So that is the true import of the word I. And that is what he said in the previous verse, that is the infinite whole, that is the one. And then in verse 22, he, he, he said, since the body, mind, intellect, life and darkness, in other words, all the five she's are jada and asat, they are not I, which is sat. Um, jada means what is not aware, asat means what does not exist, in other words, what is non-existent. So jada and asat means uh, uh, non-aware and non-existent. Um, Therefore, since they are not aware and not existent, they are not I, which is sat. Um, the implication is I is both sat and chit. The reason he didn't mention chit here, that is the opposite of asat is sat, the opposite of jada is chit. But the reason he doesn't mention chit means awareness. The reason he doesn't mention awareness here is that the pronoun I always refers to that which is aware. That is, uh, awareness is always aware of itself. So in, in language, we refer to that awareness of ourself as I. So the word I implies awareness. So when we say I am, that is implying not only our existence, that am denotes our existence, but I implies our awareness, uh, being aware. So he says, I, I is that, that is the that, that which is aware of itself as I is sat. Whereas the body, the, the five she's are not aware of themselves because they're jada and they're non existent. That is, whatever is jada doesn't actually exist because it seems to exist only in the view of ego. And ego, that, that is, all, all things that are jada are objects. All objects are jada. Objects exist only in the view of the subject. Subject is ego, but even ego isn't real because ego appears in waking and dream, disappears in sleep. Because we appear, because we rise as ego in waking and dream, as ego we are a subject and therefore there are objects. When the subject merges back into its source in sleep, all objects disappear along with it. So the, the, all the five sheaths, in fact all objects, are jada and the sat, so they cannot be I which is uh, sat, and which is by implication awareness. So here he's talking about, uh, when he's talking about jada and asat, he's implying whatever is jada is asat, and whatever is asat is jada, whatever is sat is chit, and whatever is chit is sat. That is the implication here. He makes that, he gives a very strong argument for that in verse 23, which is the verse we're dealing with today. What he says in verse 23 is, Uladu unara unagu verin mayin, uladu nubahum undipara, unave namai ulam undipara. What that means is, Uladu um, unara, to know Uludu, Uludu means what exists. To know what exists, Unavu um, Verin Mayin. Because of the non existence of any other awareness, that, mean, that implies because of the non existence of any awareness other than what exists, to know what exists, Uludu uh, um, Unavahum. What exists is awareness. <coughs> That is the first sentence, and then the, the concluding sentence is Unube Namai Ulam. Awareness alone exists as we. Um, the, the main point of this sentence, of, of this verse, is the argument that he gives in the, uh, in the first sentence. Because of the non existence of any uh, awareness, or any other awareness, to be aware of what exists, what exists is awareness. We need to understand this argument very clearly. That is, uh, there's a hidden premise here. The hidden premise is that what exists is one. 
Um, I will explain that in more detail afterwards, but let us take for granted that uh, that, that premise is, well, as I say, it's an, it's an implied premise, but what exists is one. Um, so what exists is one. If there were any awareness other than what exists, it would be a non-existent awareness. Being non-existent, it cannot be aware of anything. So they, they, there cannot be any awareness other than what exists. That's why he said, because of the non-existence of any other awareness, to be aware of what exists, what exists is awareness. That is, if, and so as I say, if, if awareness was something other than what exists, it would be non-existent, and therefore it couldn't know what exists. But we are clearly aware I am. So what is it that is aware I am? Exist, what exists is itself aware of itself as I am. Um, if, um, so as I say, if, if, if awareness was something other than what exists, it would be non-existent and therefore wouldn't be aware. If, if what exists were something other than awareness, it would then be an object known by awareness. Whatever is an object is not real, according to uh, according to Bhagavan and to Advaita philosophy. There's a very deep reason for that, which I'll explain a little in a little bit more depth afterwards. But anyway, uh, uh, the main argument is because of the non-existence of any awareness other than what exists, to, to know what exists, what exists is awareness. So there's no awareness other than what is. And so what is, is it self-awareness? What exists is it self-awareness. And so what is it that exists as, as, uh, as awareness? That he answers in the next, in the final uh, sentence. Unave namai ullam. To put it in very simple terms, he's saying uh, awareness alone is we. But he, the, the sentence is structured in a very interesting way. Um, that is, in, in Tamil, whenever you say one thing is another thing, generally, um, the word is is omitted because it's not, it, it's, it, it's understood in Tamil. So, for example, if you want to say, who am I? Am is not actually there. Nan, a, or nan, ya. Uh, that means I, who. Am is understood there. Likewise, if you want to say, I am this, nani do. I am this body, nan it deham. Uh, so uh, that is the am is usually omitted. If a, sorry, the, the verb to be, the copula, uh, is usually omitted in such sentences where you've got a where you've got a subject and um, the uh, a subject complement. And you're saying one thing is another. That is, a is b. There's no need to say is. Is can be dropped. It was it's understood there, but. In Tamil, if you do include the verb is explicitly, uh, they they always add uh, you, that uh, the, the the adverbial participle I is always added. I means uh, being or becoming. So namai uh, ullam means unave uh, namai uh, ullam means I. Uh, awareness exists as I, as we, as we. Nam means we. Uh, the reason Bhagavan says, uh, sometimes uses the plural uh, first person pronoun, nam, is because if he said awareness alone exists as I, that would be exclusive. He's excluding the, those he's talking to. Because he's including us, he says we. But actually, though he, it's we is plural in form, it is singular in implication, but there's only one I. So, uh, nam here is, uh, is, uh, represents nan, I, so that we represents I. Um, but what is particularly interesting about the way he structured this sentence, unavu is, it means awareness. Unave means awareness alone. Normally, if you, uh, awareness, we, if, in a sentence structure, we, if we say um, awareness is I, is 
is a is a third person. We, we, we would say I am awareness, but or awareness is I, because the subject, the verb always uh, um uh, it relates to, it matches the, the subject. So, so since this awareness is uh, grammatically speaking, it's a third person. So we say uh, awareness is I, it is I. So, so we're taking awareness there as a third person. To emphasize that awareness is the first person, Bhagavan uh, uses a first, uh, first person plural um, uh, form of the verb ul to, to be. So ullam means, uh, ullam on its own would mean we are. It's, that is, it's the second person, sorry, first person plural form of the verb ul. So uh, he's, he's, he's saying, he, this is like saying uh, awareness, um, awareness at, uh, it's very difficult to say it because uh, that is he's taking awareness as the first person. That's why he uses a first person form of a verb. So awareness alone exists as we. But the verb exists is is a um, is uh, is a uh, that he uses is ulam, which is a, a first person plural form of a verb to be. So uh, he's he's. But by by using this unusual, uh, what is what is syntactically, it's unusual to, to take the unavu to be a first person. But he emphasized that it's nothing but ourself. He takes unavu as a first person. That is awareness he refers to in the first person rather than in the third person. So it's a very emphatic, it's a very subtle but emphatic way of uh, emphasizing that uh, awareness is nothing but ourself. Um, as I said, this, uh, um, this argument is a very powerful argument that Bhagavan gives in the first sentence, but this argument would fall apart if there were many things that, it, uh, that exist. Uh, Uludu is a singular, um, if, you, if, you, if you wanted to say, uh, if you wanted to refer to things that exist, it would be ulana, but uladu is singular. Ulana is plural. Ulud, Bhagavan always uses the word uladu, what exists. If he uses it, it's a singular. The implication is that only one thing exists. And Bhagavan has, um, has said this in, what is that one thing that exists? Bhagavan has stated in so many places. For example, in Nana, in the first sentence of the, uh, of paragraph seven, he says, Yatatamai Uludu Atma Sarupam Andre. That means Yatatamai means actually. Uh, Uludu what exists. So what actually exists, Atma Sarupam Andre, is only Atma Sarupa. Atma Sarupa means the real nature of oneself. So what we actually are, that alone is what exists. So it is singular. And he, to make it very to, um, he could have just said, Yatatamai Uludu uh, Atma Sarupame. That would mean the same, because the, the emphasis A or added to Atma Sarupam would imply uh, only. But to make it very, very, to, to emphasize that that alone exists, he used the word Andre. Andru means uh, one, one as a, you know, it's a noun, it's a noun meaning one, so the one, or, or the one thing. Uh, Andre means only, okay? so that what, what actually exists is only Atmosarupa, there is nothing else other than our real, own real nature. Um, he says the same in, um, in Ekat Mapanchikam, in the final verse, the first sentence of the final verse, he says, a podum uludu of ekatma bastuve. A podum means always. So what always exists of uh, ekatma bastuve is that ekatma uh, bastu. Bastu means the substance. Ekatma is often translated as one self, but it actually has a deeper meaning than just uh, one self. It means one self or. Uh, Self, one. 
So it's implying that the, the one substance that actually exists is only one self. And that alone, that's right. Uh, Epodum Uludi, what, what always exists is only that, uh, is only one, one self, that one substance uh, is the implication. In the Kali Vemba version, he, uh, he added, a, um, he added uh, two words before this, uh, Tanadu Olial, Tanad Olial, um, which means by its own light. So in the Kali Vemba version, uh, this first sentence is, what always exists by its own light is only that Ekatma Vastu. Uh, that, that is was added later. So the sentence, the basic sentence is, what always exists is only that Ekatma Vastu. Uh, that Ekatma Vastu means ourself, one real substance. Um, so that is what always exists. And how does it exist? It exists by its own light. What does it mean by its own light? It is. It implies it is Swayam Prakasha. It is self-shining. That is, it, it doesn't depend upon any other light uh, to be known. That is, it knows itself by its own light because it is awareness. Um, that, that ties in very nicely with what he says in this verse 23. There is no awareness other than what exists to be aware of what exists. So what exists is awareness. That's what he implies here in, in this um, verse of, uh, this last verse of Ekama Panchkam uh, in the Kalivemba version, when he added this Kanadoliya by its own light. That is, it, no, it exists and shines by its own light. It, 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 it exists and shines here means it, it, it knows itself, it is self-shining, it, it, it knows itself by its own light of awareness, because there's no awareness other than it. Um, so in, in both these places, in that, um, in that first sentence of, uh, um, of, uh, of, verse, of pa the seventh paragraph of Nana, and in this final verse of uh, Ekama Panchpam, he's emphasizing what actually exists is only one thing, and that one thing is ourself. Um, he also implies the same in so many other places. For example, in the first sentence of verse 13 of Urujunapdu, Jnana Mam Tane Me. Jnanam here means awareness. So Jnana Mam Tane, oneself, who is awareness, uh, uh, alone is real. May, may means real. So what we, when Bhagavan talks about what is real or what is unreal, real means what actually exists. Uh, whatever is unreal doesn't actually exist, even though it's even if it seems to exist. So he, um, after, in this verse thirteen of Ulunapti, he said, "Oneself who is awareness alone is real." That means that it, the implication is what actually exists. Is only ourselves who are awareness. And then he goes on to say, awareness that is manifold is ignorance. That is awareness of the implication is awareness of multiplicity uh, is, is ignorance. And then he says in the next sentence, poya magnyanme, that is that that ignorance uh, which is unreal, uh, nyanamam tane indru, andri indru. Uh, that uh, that ignorance, that means the, the awareness of multiplicity, which is ignorant, that ignorance, which is unreal, does not, ex uh, does not uh, exist um, except as oneself or as other than oneself. It's not, nothing other than oneself. Um, and then he gives, a, to illustrate that, he gives a nice analogy. Anigal tam palavam poi. Uh, all the many ornaments are unreal. But that the multiplicity of ornaments is unreal. Mayam ponde andri undo. Say, do they exist except as gold? That is, what actually exists is only the gold. Even though it appears in many different um, ornaments, those ornaments are not real. Why does he say the ornaments are not real? Because they're impermanent. One day, a piece, a certain piece of gold, one day it may be a necklace. The next day, a goldsmith may melt it down and make it into a, 
a bangle or a tiara or into 10 different rings. So the forms are unreal, but the substance is real, is the implication. Um, of course, gold, it's only relative to the analogy that gold is real, because gold is also an appearance. But as far as the analogy is concerned, uh, gold is real, the ornaments are unreal. Likewise, the awareness that is real is only ourself. That we have a fundamental awareness. The fundamental awareness I am, that alone is real. The awareness of multiplicity, that is unreal. That is ignorance. Um, so in all these places, Bhagavan is emphasizing that what actually exists is only one. Why is awareness of, uh, of multiplicity ignorant? Because multiplicity doesn't actually exist. Multiplicity is a mere appearance. That is, uh, when we, when we, that is why awareness of, 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 of anything other than ourself is called chit abasa. Abasa means uh, a semblance or likeness. So the implication is chitabhasa is not real awareness, it's a likeness of awareness. It can also mean a reflection of awareness. And the, uh, the common analogy that is given is uh, the, the sun is self-shining, the moonlight is a reflection of the sunlight. So like that, uh, uh, the mind is said to be chitabhasa, it's, it's, it's a reflection. But the actual uh, original meaning of abhasa is a likeness or a semblance. That is a reflection, is a likeness of, if you look at your face in a mirror, the, the face you see in the mirror is not your own face, it's a likeness of your face, it's a semblance of your face. It's not really your face. So chitapasa means what is like awareness, but not actually awareness. Why is it not actually awareness? Because being aware of multiplicity, the many things that we are aware of, don't actually exist. So our awareness of them is not real awareness. Real awareness is awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself, because nothing other than ourself actually exists. Um, again, we, it, all these tie together, because the point is, everyone, that is as I said, the, the, in, the implied premise in this argument he gives here is that Uludu is one, not many. Um, so, how is it reasonable to say that there is only one thing exists, not many things? I mean, this is a this is a fundamental principle of Advaita. Ekam eva advaitiam, one only without a second. So what actually exists is one only without a second. So there is only one thing, not many things. That is the meaning of Advaita, not uh, not two-ness. There's no there's no second thing. There is only one thing. And what is that one thing? Tatvamasi, you are that. So we, we are that one thing that actually exists. So all everything other than ourself doesn't actually exist, even though it seems to exist. How is it reasonable to say so? Um, I mean, on, on what, what grounds are there for saying that other things don't exist? There's a very nice philosophical principle in Advaita that Bhagavan often used to express. Uh, the way Bhagavan often used to express it is that what seems to exist at one time, but not at another time, does not actually exist, even when it seems to exist. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 2, verse 16, uh, Krishna expresses it in a particular, the same idea in a particular way. The way what he says there is, there is never any non-existence of what exists. And there is never any existence of what does, uh, of what does not exist. That, that means what exists always exists. Whatever does not always exist doesn't actually exist at all. It's the implication of what Krishna says there. So this is a very, um, this is a very deep uh, metaphysical principle. But if we think on it, it, if we think about it, if we try to understand why it is said so, it's actually very reasonable. Because whatever is intrinsically existent must always exist. If something exists at one time and not at another time, it is not intrinsically existent. It is only its seeming existence, it borrows from something else. This Bhagavan explains very nicely. What Bhagavan says is all objects appear to whom? Only to ego. So they 
They seem to exist only in the view of ego. So from where do objects get borrow their seeming existence? They borrow it only from ego. And it's only in the view of ego that objects seem to exist. Ego is the subject. All, all phenomena are objects. They all these objects, all forms, seem to exist only in the view of ego. Um, so they are since they seem to exist only in the view of ego, they they borrow their seeming existence from ego. So does ego actually exist? No, ego doesn't actually exist because though it seems to exist in waking and dream, it ceases to exist in sleep. So according to the principle, Bhagavan's principle, whatever exists at one time, whatever seems to exist at one time, but not at another time, doesn't actually exist, even when it seems to exist. Ego doesn't actually exist. It's only a semi existence. So just like objects have borrowed their semi existence from ego, ego must have borrowed its semi existence from something else, because ego is not intrinsically existent. Since it's not intrinsically existent, it must have borrowed its existence from something else. So from what does ego borrow its existence? Only from Satchit, that is from I am. That is what actually exists is only Satchit, I am. Uh, so um, so uh, all phenomena, all the multiplicity of phenomena, all borrow their seeming existence from the one ego. And the one ego borrows its seeming existence from what actually exists, which is I am, such it. Um, so this is the, this is the, the, the reasoning behind uh, that, that, as I say, this is, the, this is the implied premise in what Bhagavan says here. That premise is clearly implied in the word Uladu. Uladu is singular. It, that is in English, if you're talking about, if you say what exists, it could be either singular or plural. Uh, you could say, um, what is in this room is um, a lot of furniture and books and uh, uh, and the light. There you're you're refer you're talking about a multiplicity of things, uh, or you could say what exists in this room is only a table. You're talking there about singular. So in English, because we don't have a plural form of the word what. Um, uh, we, if we wanted to make it plural, in English we would have to say, uh, we'd have to say those that exist as opposed to that which exists. So uludu means that which exists. It's a singular word. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the very word uludu implies that, it's only, that what exists is only one. Um, because it, as I say, it's a singular form. It's not a plural form. Um, so, so once we understand that what exists is only one thing, awareness cannot be anything other than that, because if awareness was something other than what exists, it wouldn't exist. So nothing can be other than what exists. Um, that is, even ego, though it doesn't actually exist, it couldn't even seem to exist if there wasn't that which actually exists. Likewise, all these objects, they couldn't even seem to exist if they didn't seem to exist, if they didn't appear to something, to what do they appear? To whom do they appear? To me. To me is here referring to ego. It's only when we rise as ego that we become aware of all this multiplicity. In waking and dream, we rise, we've risen as ego, and hence we're aware of multiplicity. In sleep, we don't rise as ego, and hence we are not aware of any multiplicity. So the fact that what is real is only one is clearly, it's clearly in our experience because the one thing that we experience in all the three states is I am. Since I am exists alone in sleep and other things, all other things appear in waking and dream and disappear uh, in sleep. None, no, uh, nothing other than I am is real. What is real is only I am. What exists is only I am. So what Bhagavan says here is perfectly reasonable. But the, the aim of this um, verse is to emphasize the oneness of existence and consciousness, sat and chit. What exists and what, are, what is aware are one and the same thing. 
There's not, there's not a separate thing which is aware. You know, that is, what is aware is not anything other than what exists. So what exists is its self-awareness. He, in other words, the only thing that actually exists is awareness, but not what, which awareness actually exists? Nyanamam tane me, oneself who is awareness. That is only we alone of that awareness. The awareness of multiplicity, the nanavam nyanam, is ignorant and unreal, as he says in verse 13 of um, Uludunapdu. So all these, all these different teachings that Bhagavan has given us in different places, if we understand them deeply, they're all very nicely tied together. And also, all these teachings, they superficially, it may seem, oh, this is all just uh, philosophy. What is the practical purpose of all these things? There is a, whatever Bhagavan has taught us has, a, is, has practical implications. That is, what actually exists is only awareness. And what actually exists is one, not many. So since we alone are the awareness that actually exists, knowing anything other than ourselves is not real awareness. So we cannot know ourselves as we actually are, so long as we're aware of anything other than ourselves. Because when, we, when we're aware of anything other than ourselves, we thereby limited ourselves. That is, the subject is always separate from the objects. So we, when we see this multiplicity of objects, we have to we have to separate ourselves from it. How do we separate ourselves from multiplicity of objects? By taking ourselves to be a small set of objects. That small set of objects is uh, is what is called body. In other words, the five sheaths. Now these five t- taking ourselves to be these five sheaths, we see all other objects and think these are other than ourselves. This object is myself, and these objects are other than myself. Neither is this object myself, nor that is these the other objects don't they exist only in the view of ego. Ego doesn't act an ego is nothing but the false awareness, I am this body. When we investigate ego, the adjunct drops off, and what remains is the pure awareness I am. So there are deep um practical implications in all these things. So What actually exists is only awareness. So what should we be attending to? If we want to know what is real, we shouldn't attend to anything other than ourself, because nothing other than ourself is real. What is real is only ourself, the fundamental awareness I am. That alone is real. So what should we attend to? Only to I am, not to anything other than I am. So whenever we read Bhagavan's teachings, we need to read very deeply. We need to understand, not only do we need to understand the, 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 the coherence of all that Bhagavan has taught us, how they, all these disparate teachings, how they're all logically coherent, how they all each, what Bhagavan has said in one place, it supports what he said in other places. They, they, they all form a, a simple, coherent whole. Not only do we need to understand that, we also need to understand the practical implications of whatever he's taught us. So what actually exists is only awareness. And that awareness is only ourself, the first person. There's not a second person awareness. <laughs> that the awareness can never be a second person. It's never anything other than ourself. That's why he uses the, the first person form of the, of the verb to be, unlam. Uh, uh, Referring to awareness, that is, awareness itself exists as we. When he says awareness alone exists as we, uh, uh, exists is a first person uh, plural form. Plural just uh, for the sake of inclusiveness, but it it implies uh, singular, that awareness is only one. We are only one. So these are what Bhagavan has taught us here. It's very, very, the words themselves are very simple. Even the the argument is very simple, but the, the, all, the implication of all these things is very, very deep and subtle. So, in order to understand Bhagavan's teaching deeply and clearly, it's not, of course, we need to read very carefully, we need to think very carefully about these things. But what is most important is to put all this into practice, because what exists, 
what always exists by its own light is only that ekapmavastu. That is, what is all the light that illumines all these other things is only the light of awareness. So how do we get the clarity to understand Bhagavan's teachings clearly and deeply? It's only that, that is the, the we, we cannot understand them uh, clearly and deeply without putting them into practice. To the extent to which we put them into practice, to that extent will we understand the, 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 the depth of meaning uh, uh, and the, 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 the real the implication of all that Bhagavan has taught us. So what is most important is putting into practice, trying... Um, as he says in uh, verse 44 of Aksharam Rai, Tirumbiya hamdane dinamaha kantan, teriyum enjanaya naranachala. Tirumbiya ham means turning within. Tane dinamaha kantan, see yourself daily. Daily means constantly, repeat, uh, that is persistently. Um, uh, repeatedly, yeah, or, or, or always, always see yourself with the inner eye. The inner eye means the eye of attention. So we need to be constantly turning our attention back within. To the extent to which we turn our attention back within, to face ourself alone, to that extent is our mind bathed in clarity. And to that extent will the, the deep inner meaning of Bhagavad's words become more and more clear to us. I, I want to keep enough, I think we've got enough time for questions. So can I just, um, someone had written a comment on a video that I posted yesterday, which is somewhat related to this. Can, uh, do, do you mind if I answer that comment? Uh, please go ahead, uh, Michael. How it's related is I've been talking about, um, but, uh, <clears throat> but objects are not real. That is, objects depend for their semi-existence upon the subject. This is one of the fundamental principles of Bhagavan's teachings. Um, he's made this clear in so many ways. In order to map in particular, in so many verses, he, um, well, let, let, let's start with, um, okay, I'll first read the, the, the question that I was asked, and then I'll tie all these things together. Um, that is what I, the, question I was asked, someone wrote a comment on uh, uh, a video made a few days ago, but I posted it only yesterday. Um, uh, someone called uh, Sarat uh, asked, hi, Michael, would you like to comment on the physicalist view I'm outlining below? Um, for those who aren't aware, physicalist is, um, is a more refined way of saying materialist. Materialist means the, this is the metaphysical view. That is, science is generally based on a physicalist view. Um, and the physicalist view of metaphysics is the most popular uh, view among academic uh, philosophers nowadays. Both academic philosophers and scientists, most of them have a more or less physicalist view. Not all entirely, but uh, physicalism is, 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 is very prevalent in intellectual circles nowadays. Um, so the, he, the person who wrote the comment asked me to comment on the physicalist view, and he outlines it below. What he says is, um, he's not necessarily saying this is his view, but he, this is the view of uh, the physicalist view. The objective world is real. That is, it exists independent of our perception. And the brain somehow manages to create consciousness in some way we don't understand. This inference is based on our observation of, of strong correlation between our nervous system and our conscious experience, or qualia. Qualia means the thing that we experience, the, the, the redness of a red flower, the wetness of water, the, the, that, that is the... Uh, the distinguishing qualities of, of, of phenomena, uh, but what we actually experience. Uh, and he goes on to say, also, when given anesthesia, we fall asleep. We fall into sleep. In deep sleep, the objective world exists and the brain still functions, but it temporarily stops the process which creates consciousness. 
so we don't exist then and are as good as dead. This is the physicalist view. Um, then he goes on, on waking, the brain resumes creating consciousness and using memories. And sorry, and using memories, we infer that there was such a state called deep sleep without actually experiencing that state. In dream, the brain in the real world creates an unreal world, which doesn't exist independent of perception. For some reason, we don't understand. And we falsely believe it to be real until we wake up. On waking up, we use memories to infer that the waking world existed all along, even though it was not experienced. That is the comment he wrote. This is more or less giving the, the view, the physicalist view of the world, the materialist view of the world. That is why, why it's called physicalism. It's the view that what, what actually exists is only physical things. And even consciousness, that everything must be explainable in terms of um, in terms of physics, in terms of physical, the science of uh, physical matter. Um, which, but as he says here, there's so many things they don't understand. The brain somehow manages to create consciousness in some way we don't understand. And, um, uh, and in dream, the, the, the waking brain, for some reason we don't understand, creates a, a world. So there's so many things they don't understand, but still they are very, um, they're very uh, deeply rooted in their uh, belief that what actually exists is only physical things. Um, I, I will answer this, I and mean, I will connect it with some of the things that Bhagavan has said in, in various places. That is, uh, he starts by saying, this is the fundamental contention of physicalists, but the objective world is real and it exists independent of our perception. Um, in science, great importance is given to evidence. That is scientific, all scientific theories, hypotheses and theories, they're based on evidence. And then they test those theories to see whether they can find any evidence that disproves those the theories. So they're always trying to falsify their theories. If you can't falsify a theory, the, the more you try to falsify a theory and it can't be falsified, the more robust that theory seems to be. But science is ever evolving. So after some time, even the most robust uh, uh, theories are found to be uh, inadequate. For example, for a few hundred years, Newtonian physics was, was said to be the, the final word. I mean, it was be believed to be ab the, the principles that Newton had discovered were taken to be absolute principles. In, in the past hundred years, more subtle research has been done and, and quantum mechanic and mechanics and relativity has shown that many of the principles of Newtonian physics, though they hold good in the in, um, it, under certain conditions, under the conditions of, of normal observation, they, they actually don't adequately explain all the more subtle phenomena that uh, modern research has, uh, has found, uh, quantum effects and the bending of gravity and all these things. So uh, the theories of philosophy or of science are, um, None of them are the absolute truth. They're what seem to explain what we know in the best possible way. But uh, um, it's all science. Though they give so much importance to evidence, they, 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 the whole of this physicalist view of the world is based upon the assumption that things exist independent of our perception. That is something for which there is no evidence and there never can be any evidence. How can we know, how can anything, how can there ever be any evidence that anything exists independent of our perception of it? In fact, according to Bhagavan, the physical world doesn't exist at all. It's nothing but our perception of it. There is no world out there. That is, uh, as Bhagavan says in verse 6 of Uludunapadu, the world is nothing but the five kinds of uh, sense impression, nothing else. 
There, Andrew, he says. Five kinds of sense impression mean sights, sounds, um, tactile sensation, tastes, and smells. If you remove these five kinds of sense perception, there is no such thing as world. That is, the world as we know it is only these five kinds of, of sense impression. So why should we believe that any world exists uh, independent? We know that in dream, we ex uh, 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 experience a world just like this, consisting of sight, sounds, touch, tactile sensations, tastes, and smells. But we know now that, that dream world, there wasn't any world independent of our perception of it. That world existed only in our view. It's only, it was only in our own mind that that world existed. So what evidence do we have that this world is any different? What evidence do we have that what we are now experiencing is anything but a dream? We have absolutely no evidence because whatever we experience now, we could equally well experience this in a dream. All are agreed that dreams are, what we experience in dreams are not real in the sense that they, they, though we see things and hear things, those things that we seem to, uh, to see and to hear don't actually exist. They're, they, are cre they are created only by our own mind. So what we see now is uh, just like the, the, the world we perceive in dream is only a mental world. The world we perceive now is only a mental world. We infer because I see this, therefore there's a world, because I see and hear and everything, I infer the existence, we infer the existence of a world outside. But our perceptual, in, uh, our sense impressions don't actually give any evidence that there's a world outside. Because if, if what we see now is evidence of a world outside, then equally we see the same things in dreams. So, but we don't think the dream, what we saw in a dream is evidence of anything outside. So there's absolutely no evidence that any physical world exists at all. So the physicalist view is a view based on uh, an unsubstantiated belief. That is, the, why should we believe any physical world exists at all? Um, uh, um, <clears throat> and then he says, he goes on to say, the brain somehow manages to create consciousness in some way we don't understand. Yes, we don't understand how brain creates consciousness. The very idea that the brain creates consciousness is, if we think of it deeply, it's an absurd idea. Because what is the brain? The brain is an object. What is consciousness? Consciousness is the subject. How can, a, how can an object produce the subject? Objects seem to exist only in the view of the subject. So the subject comes first, then only the objects. As Bhagavan says very clearly, I mean, he's, Bhagavan has said in so many places, but for example, in, in verse, in the fifth paragraph of Nana, Bhagavan says very nicely, um, <clears throat> that is in the fourth paragraph, Bhagavan said, uh, um, Nine vugale tavitu, um, uh, jagom endro porul anyamai ile. That is it, excluding, uh, um, excluding thoughts, there is not separately any such thing as world. And he says a similar thing in the 14th paragraph of Nana. He says, um, uh, jagom embudu nineve. What is called the world is nothing but thoughts. What he means by thoughts is any mental phenomenon is a thought. So since, since sense impressions are just mental phenomena, uh, they, that is their mental impression, they, they are all just thoughts. So there's no world other than thoughts. The whole world in a dream, when we, the world we see in a dream is nothing but our own uh, a mental fabrication. It's all our own thoughts we are seeing, our own mind we are seeing as a world. But everyone says exactly the same about this world. So what he says, having a, so according to Bhagavan, all physical phenomena are nothing but mental phenomena. They're nothing but thoughts. So in the fifth paragraph, he says, Manitil tondrum nire bugal elavatrikum, of all the thoughts that arise in the mind, 
Nanenum Ninebe, Mudum Ninebe. The thought called I alone is the first thought. The first uh, uh, word Mudal Ninebu means the first thought, but Mudal means more than just first. It means the primal, the basic, the original, or the causal thought. So all the other thoughts, the, the, the origin of all other thoughts is this first thought I. Um, and, and then he says in the next sentence, um, Idu arunda perehe enia nile wugal eru kingjana. That means only after this rises do other thoughts rise. That is, it's no other thought can rise without the first thought I. Why? Because this first thought I is the subject. All other thoughts are objects. So no object can, can appear without a subject. There has to be a subject in order for objects to appear. Because if, if there's no subject, then to whom do all the objects appear? They cannot appear without appearing to something. So, so objects depend for their semi existence upon the subject. Because objects appear are things that appear to the subject by definition. So without the subject, there are no objects. Um, so only after this rises do other thoughts rise. Actually, they arise simultaneously. What you mean by only after this arises is uh, the thought called I is the cause. The other thoughts are the effect. So all phenomena exist only in the view of the first thought I. First thought I means ego, so uh, the subject. So objects appear only in the view of the subject. Phenomena exist only in the view of, of ego. So without ego, they don't exist. So logically, ego comes first and then phenomena. Um, and then he goes on in the next two sentences to say the same thing, but in a, uh, using different terms. Whereas here he's referring to ego as the thought called I and all other things as other thoughts. In the next sentence, he refers to the ego as first person and other things as second and third person. So in the next sentence, he says, um, Tanme tondria pirahe munile padekegal tondru kindrana. That means only after the first person appears do second and third persons appear. In other words, only after ego appears do all other things appear. Because why? Because they appear only in review of ego, so they cannot appear without ego. Um, and then he says in the final sentence, Tanme indri munile padekegal ira. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. That means without the subject, objects do not exist. Because objects, uh, objects are things known. There cannot be anything known without a knower. So objects do not exist apart from the subject. So um, coming back to this, uh, what, uh, um, this idea but, uh, but uh, that is, it is an assumption they, they, that is because they're, they're physicalists, they assume that what actually exists is the physical world, and the physical world existed exists independent of our perception of it. So it existed before we were born, and it will exist after we die. So, so the consciousness that lived, exists only during the lifetime of our body, it must be something produced by a uh, physical thing. That is their. That is their twisted way of looking at things. But the, if we look at things from the perspective of our own actual experience, the, the objects, the, the brain is an object which appears within our consciousness, right? that is, it appears to us for subject. So to say that the, the, uh, the brain somehow manages to create consciousness is saying that an object somehow manages to produce the subject. There is no, it makes no sense because how can objects exist prior to the subject? The subject must come first and then only objects. So uh, according to Bhagavan, this, this physicalist view is totally incoherent. It's, uh, it makes no sense at all. If we, if we think of it deeply in terms of our own experience, they are making an assumption. They're putting the cart before the horse. That is, first we rise as ego, then only we are aware of the physical world. We say, well, why do we say, Bhagavan often used to say, 
does the world come and tell you that it exists? No, it is we who say the world exists. The world never says, I, hey, look at me, here I am, I exist. It is we who look at it and say, oh, there's a world. That is, we project this world and then say, oh, this world exists. Um, and then he goes on to say, uh, that this inference of theirs is based on our observation of a strong correlation between our nervous system and uh, conscious experience or qualia. Um, if, when neuroscientists do research, they find that by, uh, for example, just uh, this, just one example of uh, they by stimulating certain areas of the brain, they can bring about certain experiences. Or when we have a certain experience, when we, for example, see a red flower, that produces some type of, um, there's, there'll be some type of uh, electrochemical activity in a particular part of the brain. So the seeing of a red flower stimulates the brain. So they see a correlation between the, um, the activity of the neurons in the brain and what we are experiencing. And therefore, they say, uh, therefore, conscious experience is created is caused by the brain. That's their view. But what we experience, what the philosophers like to call qualia, that the qualities of what we experience, they are not consciousness. Qualia are not consciousness. What they call conscious experience is not consciousness. <laughs> it is things that we experience consciously. It is what is what we are conscious of. They are, in other words, they're objects. That is, the, the neurons in the brain are objects. The qualia are equally objects. The consciousness, that is, what is conscious, is not an object, it's a subject. So just because there's a correlation between qualia and um, what is happening in the brain, it, it doesn't, it, there's no meta, we can't draw any metaphysical um, uh, conclusion from that. They conclude, because there's a correlation, therefore the, what happens in the brain must be the cause of, uh, of what we experience, the qualia. But all the objects anyway, we, you cannot understand consciousness by studying objects, because consciousness can never be an object. Consciousness is the subject. In fact, the real consciousness is not even the subject. It's the reality that lies behind the subject. But uh, from their point of view, the consciousness they're talking about is, is, the, the, is ego, the subject, the one who is aware of all this. But instead of trying to investigate who am I who am aware of this, they, they're investigating objects. They're investigating the brain. They're investigating qualia. All these are objects, things that are other than ourselves, anya. So their, their inference is, is, is a, a very faulty inference. If they, they think that because there's a, uh, a correlation between nervous activity, neural activity in the brain, and what we experience, therefore neural activity is causing what we experience. Why not vice versa? It is, all they are establishing is a correlation. They're not, they, because they, there's no, um, though they're correlated, there's no logical reason why certain ac activity in the brain should produce a certain experience or why a certain experience should produce a certain activity in the brain. So there's no strong um, cause and effect uh, relationship is there. It just happens to be a correlation. And, but all, it's, they cannot, so long as they are investigating objects, they cannot know consciousness because consciousness is not an object, it's the subject. So the whole, the whole attempt of science and also the attempt of most uh, modern philosophers, because they're all they're thinking only in objective terms. They're thinking about qualia. Qualia are not consciousness. Qualia are things that, of which we are conscious. They're second and third person. Consciousness is the first person. Um, uh, and then he says, uh, also when given anesthesia, we fall asleep. In deep sleep, the objective world exists and the brain still functions. What evidence is there for that? What evidence is there from our experience? There's, our experience gives us no evidence that the uh, objective world or the brain exists when we're asleep. In, 
we don't we now we are not perceiving the um the dream world we don't assume that the dream world and the dream brain still exist we know they were a mental creation what evidence do we have that the present world that we experience is anything other than a mental creation that this is anything other than a dream there's absolutely no evidence so if they want to be truly scientific science is based on evidence since there's no evidence that there's a physical world the whole thing falls apart. Science is very useful for understanding how things behave in a dream, but it cannot tell us what lies beyond the dream. It cannot tell us about the nature of the dreamer. That is what we are investigating now. What is, what is conscious? What is the subject? It is the dreamer, not anything in the dream. So we, if we want to understand what is consciousness, we need to investigate not the things that are perceived, who am I the perceiver? To whom do all these things appear? That is what we need to investigate. Um, so all, the, all this, uh, it, this is, I mean, I could go on analyzing this, but I think I've explained enough. But, um, we can, in so many places, Bhagavan has emphasized that, that objects depend upon the subject. I, I gave this one example of what he says in, in the fifth paragraph of Nana, but there are so many other places in Uludunapadu. For example, in um, verse 26 of Uludunapadu, he says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. What he's saying there is what he, he's talking about our actual experience. In waking and dream, ego has risen, and therefore everything else appears. In sleep, ego doesn't exist, so nothing else exists. So Bhagavan is talking about our actual experience, whereas these physicalists, they, are, they, are, they, are, they have a certain set of beliefs for which there is no evidence, and they try to build everything on... on so they, uh, for example, they... Uh, they they accuse religious people of believing in a god for which there's no evidence, but they believe in a world for which there's no evidence. At least the, the religious people and the um, and the um, materialists they agree on one thing, but there's a world. But one doesn't agree with even that. But one says there is no world. The world exists only in your view. It has no independent existence. So I, I hope I, I hope that will answer that. But why I connect that is what according to Bhagavan, what exists is only I am. Uh, uh, not even the subject exists, the reality, right? That is the subject is a mixed awareness. I am this body. The the pure in the view of pure I am, there is only I am. There's only that awareness. It's only when I am is mixed with adjuncts. But this world seems to exist. That is the I am mixed with adjuncts is ego, the subject, the first person, the thought called I. And only in the view of that do all other do all objects exist. Um, but when we, if we investigate ourselves and experience ourselves as just I am, that is we isolate I am, separate it from all these adjuncts. That, that if we focus our attention on I am so clean, keenly, but the adjuncts uh, drop off, that is, they, they, the adjuncts cease to appear in our awareness, then there will be neither subject nor object. That is, the reality underlying the subject is the fundamental awareness I am. That alone is real. That's what Bhagavan is talking about in this verse when he says, when he refers to that which exists. That which exists is only awareness, because there's nothing other than that which exists to be aware of it. Thank you, Michael. Um, um, I think you, you really stressed that point um, about science. You know, people are confused, um, you know, when they're trying to apply science. It seems that this phenomenal world, the illusory world, has some you know, happens to function with some rules, and uh, which is what is described as physics, chemistry, and biology. But yes. again, they all belong to this illusory realm. Yes. And yes. trying to use science to understand 
or explain the true awareness it just doesn't make sense they just yeah. just don't, both don't go together that's yeah. just my take on this that is i'm not putting down science science yeah, exactly right right, right. you're not putting down uh, science so, it just said it belongs so, to different so, realm yeah it, it's fine that is scientists they study science is a science of objects they study objects how objects behave but it's, so long as they're looking outwards they that is so long as we see objects the objects seem to be real in dream we see objects so long as we're dreaming those objects seem to be perfectly real why because those objects are part of the dream world and in dream we seem to be a part of, we also seem to be a part of that dream world we take us we we experience ourselves as if we were a body in that dream though we are a dreamer we don't experience ourselves as a dreamer we experience as ourselves as a person in the dream in other words the creator experiences itself as a creature so so long as we're dreaming the dream world seems to be real so long as we're dreaming this dream this world seems to be real and so philosophy um i mean science and history and geography and all these things they all seem to be real and of course we have to behave accordingly um we can we 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 know there's it's if as true as this world there is something called the law of gravity so we don't climb up to the top of a of a 40 story building and jump off the top we we know what's going to happen so there, there are laws that seem to govern this dream world so we abide by those laws but it science is very useful for understanding this how this world uh, works but it we cannot use science as a basis for any metaphysics because science is based on a metaphysical assumption for which there is no evidence namely the assumption that things exist independent of our perception of it for which there is no evidence and there never can be any evidence so bhagavan bhagavan talks about that about which we can be sure but what is the one thing about which there can be no doubt i am that is i am means as as i said i refers to ourselves as awareness our, our existence as awareness cannot be doubted why because whether if, let everything else be illusory even to experience an illusion we must exist and we must be aware so our existence and our awareness are the only things about which we are certain everything else let it be real let it be unreal we got no we we cannot we cannot um all we can say is it appears to be it seems to be but to whom does it seem to be to me so we need to invest if we want to know the truth of objects we need to know the truth of the subject because objects appear only in the view of the subject what is the truth of the subject the truth of the subject is only awareness Uh, that is the, not not the awareness of things but the fundamental awareness i am that alone is real so bhagavan's teachings are all about that so whereas science is looking outwards bhagavan's teachings are looking inwards right no they let we bhagavan has no nothing against science let science do their thing but bhagavan says so long as you're looking outwards you're going to experience misery he says in the 14th paragraph of nana he says very very clearly towards the end jagamembadu ninebe what is called the world is only thoughts jagam mariam podu adavdu ninevatrapodu manam anandate anubhavit kindradu uh, that is um when uh, when the uh, when the world disappears that is when uh, when there are no thoughts the mind experiences happiness jagam tondram podu adavdu adu dukate anubhavikinchadu when the world appears it experiences misery that misery here dukam dukam means dissatisfaction that is we are never we are never totally happy so long as we're experiencing the world because the world seems to we we are limiting ourselves we 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 see the world only when we limit ourselves as a person within that world 
And as a limited person, we cannot experience the infinite happiness that we actually are. So Bhagavan gives a warning to scientists. Yes, fine. So long as you want to continue making research on the world, you're free to continue doing so. But you will not find happiness. You will only be, you'll be ever discontented. You'll be ever seeking something. You'll be seeking more and more and more and more. There's no end to it. The more you make research on objects, by making research on objects, what do you find? You find more objects. That is, the, the more they, they, uh, they, uh, physics makes research, whether on um, in the outer space, the more, they, the more powerful telescopes we have, the more we, uh, objects we find out in the universe that need explaining. The more we look down into, the, uh, into uh, uh, matter at its uh, most basic level of atoms and electrons and everything and quarks and um, and uh, all, all, I mean, so, so many things. They, they, the more research they make, the more they find objects. Because you can't find the subject by looking among objects. If you want to know the truth of the objects, you first need to know the truth of the subject. To know the truth of the subject, you have to stop looking at objects and look at the subject. When the subject looks at itself, as Bhagavan says, it will, it will subside and dissolve back into its source, which is the pure awareness I am. When subject disappears, objects will disappear with it. Because all objects depend upon subject for their seeming existence. So if we want happiness, Bhagavan's path is the way. If we want to, to endlessly be learning more and more and more, but never contented, science is the way. So the choice is ours. Nalini, do you want to go ahead and ask your question, please? I was just going to say that um, you know, what, what science and the spiritual uh, world mean by consciousness is entirely different. I mean, it's often used interchangeably, and that's when confusion arises. Yes. So I've learned to dissociate myself completely from the uh, word consciousness as it leads to a uh, and as to what consciousness or because awareness and consciousness is used interchangeably in the spiritual world or even in the athletic world. Yes. So, um, so I think uh, that, that is where the confusion arises. Because, um, as Michael said, we're talking about or investigating different things. Yes, so, yes. I, I, I mean, I think... It, Modern philosophy and science has has no clear idea about consciousness because they don't even they 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 don't even agree upon a definition for it. First, we need to understand that is one one of the basic principles of Advaita is uh, drik drisi aviveka, uh, 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 distinguishing the seer from what is seen. Object, consciousness is not what is seen. It is not an object. Consciousness is the subject. So until they are ready to accept that consciousness is not an object, and therefore you cannot uh, find the truth of, um, of consciousness by looking among objects. Uh, that is, they have so many different theories now. One of the theories is panpsychism, but everything is conscious. But that's a, it's not everything is conscious. Everything appears in consciousness. All objects appear in consciousness. That doesn't, the ultimate substance is only consciousness. But that doesn't mean objects are conscious. So they, they, they first need to clearly recognize the distinction between subject and object. If you want to understand consciousness, you need to, make, you need to investigate the subject, not of the object. Not even the subtlest types of objects, not even thoughts or feelings or anything. Uh, uh, the one to whom do all these things appear? That is what we need to investigate. That's why Bowen often used this question, to whom? To whom did this appear? To me. Then investigate who that me is. I think the one word that uh, scientists don't use is beingness. So, um, <coughs> 
Yes, because science is not is not actually a science of existence. It's a, it's not a science of being. The science uh, uh, studies the behavior of things. It doesn't think it, it, it knows how things behave. It doesn't know what things are. To understand being again, we can't separate being from consciousness. So to understand being. We need to investigate the subject, not the objects, because the objects seem to exist, but they seem to exist only in the view of the subject. So to understand the truth of the existence of objects, we need to know the truth of the existence of subject. Thanks, Michael. That was an elegant uh, explanation. Thank you. <laughs> right. um, I noticed Rabbi, uh, yeah, asked Rabbi some... had a question. Rabbi, please go ahead. This is a question that uh, pops up in my mind from time to time. Uh, I try to explain in the light of Bhagavan's teaching, and I have an inelegant explanation that I will broach and see if you can uh, give me a more convincing explanation for this phenomenon or this example, that if you keep a camera rolling while you go to sleep, and then you wake up and watch the recording, you will see that your body and the world around you, mainly the room, did exist. Now, one could say that uh, what I'm viewing on waking is also a projection of my mind, a phenomenon. Is that uh, the right explanation? Or is yes, more yes. Convincing? What Bhagavan would have said in such cases, that people often used to say to Bhagavan, but Bhagavan, you say the body and world don't exist in sleep. But other people see the body and world, and uh, they, when I wake up, they tell me that, that my body continues to exist. So how can you say the body doesn't exist? Bowen said, let those people come and tell you why you're asleep. You, you, that, that video, you can watch only in waking state. You cannot watch it while you're asleep. Right. That, that, that is Bhagavan's fundamental contention yeah, is that whatever is seen is only a dream. Ah. So if this waking state is a dream, the video we watch in dream of our body sleeping is all part of this dream. Right. So it doesn't, you, that is, all these are very, very uh, inadequate answers. Because it's only in the waking state where we can find any evidence that the body existed while we were asleep. But that evidence appears only in the waking state. Why doesn't if that if it's evident that the, if the world actually exists in in um, in uh, sleep, why doesn't it appear in our sleep? Nice. We we are aware. I am. But we're not aware of anything else. So what? What does that? What do we have to infer from that? If the world actually existed, it, it should appear to us. But it doesn't appear to us. Why not? We were there, but no world was there. So we know clearly from our own experience that sleep is a state in which we alone exist. All right. Thank. You. We we can believe. Oh, the world continued while I was asleep. But that's a mere belief. There's no evidence. You can't find any evidence. Because any, you, okay, someone shows you a video of your body sleeping. Is that evidence that you, your body existed when you were asleep? No, because there's so many other explanations. You can say this is all a dream. It's, to say everything is a dream is a much more parsimonious explanation. That is one of the, uh, another principle in science is um, that the first thing they want everything to be objective, but there are so many ways of explaining that if the same phenomena can be explained in a, a multitude of different ways. So science always looks for the simplest explanation, the explanation that entails the, um, the, uh, the assumption of the fewest number of entities. That's what's called a parsimonious entity. That is called in philosophy, uh, Occam's razor. Always choose the simplest explanation. Why? 
it's not necessarily true that the simplest explanation is, is, is the correct explanation, but the simplest explanation is more likely to be true than a complicated explanation. Because a complicated explanation, if any one thing is wrong, the whole explanation falls apart. So if you've got, if you've got an elaborate explanation, you're making more assumptions. A simpler explanation makes fewer assumptions. So to say everything is a dream is the most parsimonious explanation. Because the physicalists say there's actually a world out there. And then all their science, everything, all these um, quarks and quasars and um, um, uh, uh, quantum effects and all these things, these, you have to assume that all these are true. But if all this is a dream, that's much simpler. Because they're just me, they're just my mind, and the world that my mind projects. So the, si the simplest explanation of all that we experience is what is called drishti shristi vada. But nothing ex but perception is itself creation. Nothing exists independent of our perception of it. That is the simplest explanation. So that is the explanation that is most likely to be true. How do we verify it? What we do know is objects appear only in the view of the subject. But, so if the subject wants to know the truth about objects, it first knows to know the truth about itself, in whose view they seem to exist. So if the subject investigates itself, or, uh, as Bhagavan has pointed out, to the extent to which we turn our attention back to ourselves, ego subsides. And if we attend to ourselves keenly enough, ego will dissolve forever in its source. And what then remains, that alone is the reality. That is what always exists. And that is I am. So Bhagavan's teachings are so simple and so elegant. And you can, we can answer whatever objections people make, whatever other ideas people, whatever other philosophies people may put forward philosophies or theologies or whatever, uh, whether it's a scientific philosophy or a religious philosophy, we can, we can point out the, 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 the weaknesses in all their arguments. Because we don't actually have evidence that anything exists apart from ourselves. The only thing that is self-evident, that is uh, indubitably true, is I am. Everything else appears in our view. When only when we rise as ego and waking and dream. So it's so obvious that objects depend on the subject. That is the assumption of most uh, philosophers and scientists is because you see it, it's true. According to Advaita, because you see it, it's untrue. So, um, Shohan is requesting an explanation. Uh, go ahead, Shohan. What, on what did he need explanation for? Yes, thank you, Kumar. Thank you, Michael, for that awesome <laughs> talk. Um, but it, in uh, uh, previously, you said something about um, the conscious, the consciousness that is attending to the non-real or the impermanent things are also not that real consciousness it's uh yeah, yeah that was really awesome can you please okay. say more about that okay um there's actually only one consciousness when that one consciousness seems to be looking outside it's called ego that is when um what do you mean by inside and outside? Let's go, let's go back to the basic. According to Bhagavan, everything other than ourself is outside. What is inside is only ourself. So uh, uh, looking within means looking at ourself. Looking at anything else is looking outside. So with that basic definition, the nature of ego is to look outside. But when it looks outside, it sees forms. As Bhagavan pointed out in verse 4 of Uludhinapadu, we, the world and God, appear to be forms only when we experience ourselves as a form. That is what he says there is in verse 4 of Uludhinapadu, Uruvum tanayin uluhu paramatran. That means if oneself is a form, 
the world and God will be likewise. That is, it's only when we experience ourself as a form that we experience the world and God as forms. Uruvum tan andrel uvatrin uruvate kan urudul yavan evan. That means if oneself is not a form, who can see their forms and how? That is, it's only when we mistake ourselves to be a form that we see other forms. When do we mistake ourselves to be a form? When we rise as ego. That is, the nature of ego is to always take, project a form which it takes as itself, and through the five senses of that form, it projects so many other forms, through the mind on five senses of that um, of that uh, of that body, it, 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 it uh, is aware of so many other forms. So forms seem to exist only in the view of ego. When we don't rise as ego, when we remain as we actually are, what we actually are is formless. And therefore, it, 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 the pure awareness is never aware of anything other than itself. Only the awareness that is mixed and conflated with uh, adjuncts, with uh, forms, sees other forms. That is, it's only as ego that we see other things. So when we are looking outwards, we are ego. When we look inwards, when we look at ourselves alone, we cease to be ego and we remain as pure awareness. So awareness is only one. The awareness looking outwards is called ego. The same awareness looking at itself alone is what we actually are. And But even when we rise as ego, and look at other things, what we actually are always remains as it is, because it is immutable. So this ego is a total fiction. I mean, it, it doesn't actually exist at all, as we will find if we investigate it. It's, not, it's no use just saying, oh, ego doesn't exist, because so long as we're seeing other things, ego seems to exist, because in whose view do all these other things exist? To whom do they appear? Only to me. That me who is aware of other things is ego. So we need to investigate this ego. When we investigate this ego, we will find that it's not actually ego, it is just pure awareness. Since it is pure awareness, it is, it, it is not aware of anything other than itself. It was never aware of anything other than itself. Therefore, the ultimate truth is only a jata. Nothing came into existence. Nothing has ever ceased to exist. What is alone is as it always is. That is Uladu. That is Unavu. That is a, what actually exists. That is what is, what is actually aware. That is the pure awareness. Yeah, you said something about um, it, be, it, it limiting ourselves by looking outwards. Yes. And. and uh, other things, it's limiting ourselves, which is, which to me is very has a very practical Im implication. Yes, and that is that is we're limiting ourselves by looking at those things, and that makes us unhappy. It's like we're binding right. ourselves down, right. right, and being unhappy. Yes, yeah, that that is the this distinction between inside and outside. This. In sleep, there's no distinction between inside and outside. It's only when we rise as ego that this distinction out inside and outside uh, comes into being. Why do they, what is this distinction? As I say, everything other than ourself seems to be outside, seems to be something other than ourself, anya, something other than ourself. So that is outside ourself. We are, we are inside, or what is called inside is only ourself. So, so long as we are looking outside, that means we're looking at things other than ourselves. When we look at things other than ourselves, we are thereby limited because we, that is, it's only when we limit ourselves that other things seem to exist. If we are the unlimited whole, there is nothing other than ourselves. And therefore, we are aware just of ourselves. There are no names, forms, nothing. It's only when we rise as ego that we bring all these names and forms and all this separation and otherness is brought into existence by our rising as ego. So ego is by definition limited. It's the unlimited awareness is not aware of any forms because it's unlimited. It's for, what is unlimited is formless. So it cannot be aware of any forms. 
but he's aware of forms, he's only this limited ego. Thank you, Michael. Srikant, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Michael, thank you so much. I've uh, been enjoying the, the explanations. In fact, I'm new to the Ramana Center as well, just recently started attending the sessions. Um, uh, so, you know, the, you spoke about ego uh, in a lot of explanations. So, yeah. uh, and ego rises during the wake state and the dream state. So, uh, that means that uh, it is a necessity and hence we were designed this way. Uh, so, should, is it a fair statement when you say that ego is a necessity, but limited to just helping us to function in the real world uh, or the physical world? Ego and the uh, second ego. extension to that question is, uh, you know, typically ego is seen in a negative way. Uh, but what is the right way of seeing it? Ego is a necessity in a sense. <laughs> but it's only when we rise as ego that the world seems to exist. So it's only in the view of ego where there seems to be a world. So if you want to experience a world, yes, ego is necessary. Because except by rising as ego, you cannot experience a world. In that sense, it's necessary, but it is not necessary for us. That is, ego is not what we actually are. We are perfectly happy. In, we can see from our own experience. In sleep, we are perfectly happy. We have no complaints in sleep. We don't feel in sleep, oh, ego is necessary. I'm miserable now because I don't have ego. <laughs> it, uh, all the problems arise with ego. That is the only in waking and dream that we experience problems. In sleep, nobody has any complaints. Nobody, there, there are no problems at all in sleep because ego isn't there. So about ego, viewing ego in negative way, yes, ego is, according to Bhagavan, ego is the root of all problems. When ego is very strong, it manifests in, 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 as, um, as pride, egotism, selfishness. And um, it gives rise to all um, greed and all negative things. So ego is the root of all evil. So it, it's right to view it in negative terms. The way it's, ego is usually understood is in a more gross way. But actually, e what does ego mean? Ego means I. So according to Bhagavan, that is the root of everything. I means here, not the pure I, but I mixed with adjuncts. That is ego. A separate I. Well, how does I become separate? By limiting itself as adjuncts. But pure awareness is not any is not separate it, it, because it's unlimited. It's only when we limit ourselves as the name and form of a body that all these problems come into existence. That uh, that limited awareness. I am this body. I am this person. I am Sri Kant or Michael or whoever. It's only to that limited awareness eye, that is that adjunct mixed awareness eye, that all these problems arise. That adjunct mixed awareness eye is ego. Drop the adjuncts as we do every day in sleep, and what remains is that pure awareness, which is infinite happiness. Does that adequately answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> So ego is necessary, but in a very different way to the way people usually understand it. Well, it's not necessary. If it's necessary if we are to experience the world. But why should we experience the world? We are perfectly happy without any world in sleep. And as soon as we experience the world, we have all sorts of problems. So being, so being egoless, egoless and hence worldless is the best option. That is the one thing that is agreeable to everyone. Whatever, or Michael, whatever be your beliefs, whether you're a whether you're an atheist or a or a religious person, whether you're a communist or a fascist, whatever be your political beliefs, your religious beliefs, your metaphysical beliefs, and whether you like to be rich or you're not concerned about wealth, whether you like to be learned or you're not concerned about learning. Whatever it is, one thing we all agree on is we all like to sleep. There is nobody who complains about sleeping. Oh, I'm so miserable while in sleep. Why do I have to sleep? Nobody says that. 
because we all know the state of sleep is very agreeable. Why is it agreeable? Because we are free of ego. And because we are free of ego, we are, therefore we are free of all problems. So what Bhagavan says is, it's so clearly true that ego is the root of all problems. Because all problems appear to whom? Only to ego. When we don't rise as ego, no problems. So if you want to experience problems, ego is necessary. If you, if you, if you have no interest in experiencing problems, then ego is not necessary. But Michael, so uh, <clears throat> if I can paraphrase this, so ego is necessary and so let's say, you know, we need to perform certain actions uh, in the physical world. Who is that uh, we? That is ego. <laughs> actions are only for ego. Without, without ego, there are no actions. And there's no need of actions. So first Srikant comes into existence, then the world comes into existence, then the need for actions, etc., etc. Yes. No actions, and we don't feel any need for actions when we're asleep. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to, 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 to shut you up, but uh, I, we, we need to understand ego is the, is, the, is the root cause of all of everything. Bhagavan says in verse 26 of Wundanapu, if the ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. Everything includes the world, the actions, the responsibilities, the, the role we have as a, as, a, as a child to our parents, as a parent to our children, as a husband or a wife, as an um, executive or a road sweeper or whatever we may be. All these things come into existence only when we rise as ego. Does that answer your question, Srikant? I think uh, <laughs> let me reflect and next yeah, week. If you take some time, it's pretty heavy, in <laughs> dense in the sense, <laughs> like, you know, because to the extent that we try to understand it, it, it's hard. And the more and more we practice, it becomes easier. And that's. Um, uh, it, it just starts sinking in at a different level, you know, they ask you, because we practice more and more. And then I'll, I'll let Michael explain that. <laughs> Bhagavan pushes us in at the deep end because Bhagavan wants us to swim and save ourselves. So the most effective way to learn to swim is to be pushed in the deep end. So Bhagavan, Bhagavan's teaching, this is the very deepest of, of, of all philosophies, but it's also the most practical. If we want to be happy, so we, we all want to be happy, but we're all looking for happiness in the right in the wrong direction. Bhagavan wants us to look in the right direction. What is the right direction? Where can happiness be found? Only within ourselves. So all Bhagavan's teachings are pushing us back within, to look within. Because what we are all seeking is within ourselves. We are that. So it, that, that is... It doesn't matter if we don't understand everything perfectly at first. We, we inevitably we won't. But if we if we are drawn to Bhagavan's teachings and if we try and put them into practice, with the passing of time, right, as we as we persevere in our practice, all these things will become more and more and more clear. Then we'll have a completely different perspective on life. When you talk about the necessity of ego. You talk about the necessity of ego because you think other things are necessary. You think action is necessary. Yes, if action is necessary, then ego is necessary because it's ego who is the actor, the doer. So, so all these things seem to be necessary because we're looking from the wrong perspective. We take the world to be real. We take ourselves to be this body. I mean, how do we survive in this world? How do we take, we have so many responsibilities. We've got family, we've got friends, we've got job, we've got all these responsibilities. So all these things, so many things seem to be necessary. But if all this appears necessary only because we've risen as ego. 
that is, ego is necessary for all these things, but do we want all these things? Do we want all these troubles? Or do we want to be happy? Do we, infinitely happy. That's what Bhagavan is offering us, infinite happiness. We, so long as we rise as ego, we cannot experience the infinite happiness that we actually are. Therefore, we need to investigate ourselves to find out what we actually are. Just a quick comment, uh, Michael. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Uh, uh, so, so you would need uh, so the desire to seek itself also stems from the ego. Yes, because that is our real nature is infinite happiness and infinite love. So we all love to be happy. So even when we rise as ego, that love for happiness is our nature. So as ego, we are always seeking happiness. The problem is we are seeking it outside ourselves and therefore we are not, we, we cannot find it outside ourselves. So we're looking in the wrong place. So when we have, we, through cause of gemmas, through cause of lives, we have been seeking happiness outside ourselves and we have not been satisfied. So now we have reached a stage where we are looking for some other solution. Because in so many lives, we've accumulated wealth and uh, we've had name and fame and we've had learning and all these, so many ways in which we um, people seek happiness. We've experienced all these things and none of these things have satisfied us. And even if it is, they were all temporary because whatever we, supposing we accumulate lots of wealth or lots of learning or lots of name and fame, how long will it last as long as this body lasts? Then we have to start all over again. Uh, so uh, we, we have, the fact that we are here talking about Bhagavan's teachings means we're looking for something beyond, uh, beyond what is offered by the material world. Not only this material world, even heaven or whatever, that is not satisfactory. None of these things are satisfactory. So we've now come to understand that the, the, the profoundly unsatisfactory nature of embodied existence. That is, so long as we are embodied, we cannot be satisfied. So we now, because we are all driven by desire for happiness, that is the greatest saint and the greatest sinner. <laughs> all and everyone in between, all are driven by one, one, the one driving force behind all our actions is that desire for happiness. So we're all seeking the same thing. It's just now it has become clear to us that we can't find this outside ourselves. So we are drawn to Bhagavan who says, look within. So yes, it is ego, but bhakti, who, has, who is the bhakta? It's only ego is the bhakta. But the ego, will be, we will become true bhaktas only when we surrender this ego and remain as we actually are. That is the supreme devotion, to be as we actually are. So bhakti is necessary. Bhagavan often used to say, bhakti is the mother of jnana. Right? That bhakti means love. So we cannot know ourselves as we actually are without all-consuming love to know ourselves as we actually are. Because so long as we have desire for other things, our mind will keep keeps on going out. And we're not ready to surrender ourselves. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, Stephen, do you, do you have a question? So I'm listening for the simplicity. <laughs> and thank you, Michael. <laughs> So when I wake up, I go immediately to self-attention. And then when I'm finished self-attention, then I'm going to go back to sleep. Yep. That, that should okay. be our aim. That should be our aim. That the waking was, dream state. Yeah, that, that was absolutely... Sean expressed some satisfaction in his, his response. Uh, your response to his questions. And I'm feeling that right now. The yeah, simplicity of it. 
Yeah, the simplicity is what I'm looking for because my ego has the questions, all the questions. Yeah. And I had so many questions and I was listening to everyone else's questions and your responses to them. And I'm saying, oh my goodness, if it wasn't for the necessity of feeding this body for the existence, you know, of others that are important to me and my family and my life, Sleeping and self attention would be the, uh, the answer yeah. for me. Unfortunately, if, all that other stuff comes in the middle. So that's where you can help me is yeah. the gap. Okay. According to Bhagavan, you don't need to worry about the other stuff. All your responsibilities to your family, what you are to do for your family, you, your body, speech, and mind will be made to do. We don't actually need to think of anything. We need to attend only to ourselves. If we have so much love to attend to ourselves, everything else will be taken care of. Because anyway, as Bhagavan said, what is to happen is going to happen. So whatever actions, whatever actions you, your body, speech, and mind are destined to do, in order for you to fulfill your, in order for your prarabdha to unfold, in order for you to fulfill all your duties, they will be made to do. So you don't actually have to concern yourself about anything other than being self-attentive. This is the ideal we are, we should be aiming for. In practice, we, we all, what comes in between is not all our responsibilities, it's not any of these things. What comes in between is our Vishaya Vasanas, our liking, our inclination to go outwards, our inclination to take interest in so many things other than ourselves. That is the problem. Yeah. That we will, those Vishaya Vasanas, we can overcome them, we can weaken them, and eventually eradicate them only by persistent practice of self attentiveness. So though Bhagavan has said we should be self-attentive all the time, in practice that may not seem to be possible, but we can try. We can try to be self-attentive as much as we can. And slowly, slowly, our self-attentiveness will take over our whole life. What the body, speech, and mind are destined to do, they will go on doing. We need not be concerned about that. Mm. Our only concern need be to be self-attentive. Because to the extent we are self-attentive, we are thereby surrendering ourselves to God. And God is taking care of it. Whether we, whether we, uh, we, we, whether we um, uh, attend to it or not, whatever is to happen in this world will be taken care of by God. So leave the entire burden to him. Our only, the only responsibility by one has given us is attend to yourself. And the if answer you, to your question. If you attend to yourself, your family will be taken very good care of by Bhagavan. Cannot Bhagavan take better care of your family than you can? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that one. <laughs> Uh, I think it just because lost a they're lot not of weight your of family, they're his family. So leave it all. To yes, him. yes. He is okay. the father and mother of all of us. So as a father and mother, he's taking care of everything. The trouble is, we are not ready to. to we want to interfere. No, don't take care of it in this way. Take care of it in this way. I prefer it in this way, not the way you want it, the way I want it. So we want him to surrender his will to us. But the wise course is for us to surrender our will to him because he's all knowing his will will be, a much, will be much better than our will. He knows what is really good for us. Thank you. And you answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is all, it's not even me who's answering. I, I'm just a, a, like, a, like a speaker. All this is Bhagavan. This is what Bhagavan has taught us. And I understand that. 
Uh, which goes to something else uh, Anant said uh, that's profound for me. Um, he said, love d- dissolves the ego. Yes. And it fits so well for me in hearing that. Other than self-attention, my ego has me wanting to do something in that arena. Can you kind of speak about how love dissolves ego? There is a beautiful prayer in Arunachakram, like verse 100, well, there are 108 beautiful prayers, but one is particularly relevant in this context. Bhagavan says, like ice in water, melt me as love in you the form of love. That is, love is the very nature of God, or our, our real nature is love. When we, li- when we rise as ego and limit ourselves as this body, that infinite love that we have for ourselves is distorted and takes the form of desires and uh, likes, dislikes, desires, uh, aversions, uh, attachments, fears, and so on. So long as we see things other than ourselves, some things we like, some things we dislike. So this, this love is distorted by our looking outwards. If we want to experience love in its pure condition, we need to look within. One mistaken idea that many people have about love is that love is always for another. But Bhagavan said the greatest love we all have is love for ourselves. If we love others, it's because, why do we love others? Why do we love God, for example? Because we think God gives us, um, he's doing good for us. But whatever God is doing is good for us. If we believe God was giving us trouble, if we believe God was an evil God who just wanted to torment us, would we love him? No, we wouldn't. Likewise, do we, even our family, we love our family because they seem to contribute to our happiness. But if our family were always giving us trouble, they were always tormenting us and not doing, uh, I mean, going against us and giving us endless trouble, our love for them would inevitably wane. We, we, we cannot love what gives us trouble. So, so, so ultimately, all that, that is the, the basis of all love is love for ourselves. But now, because we've limited ourselves as this person, we now love this person. I love Michael, you love Stephen, because you take yourself to be Stephen. But if you turn your attention within and find out what you actually are, then your love becomes unlimited, Mm. because you are unlimited. That is why Bhagavan, Bhagavan's love was equal to all. For Bhagavan, there was no high or low, rich or poor. All these differences meant nothing to Bhagavan. He loved everyone, not only all, everyone in human form, in all other forms. He was equally kind to, to the squirrels and the dogs and the monkeys, even and to the cow. scorpions and the snakes. When the scorpion called up, he just sat there and let it, let it walk. He's least concerned. It's doing its thing. He does his thing. So Bowman, when the hornet stung, stung him, he had so much love for those hornets, and he was he he felt for the fact that he had, uh, though unintentionally, he had disturbed their nest. So he could he could empathize with the anger that they felt. So he he just let them sting. He stood there calmly and let them sting his thigh to their heart's content. And when they were contented, then he, with great difficulty, he. Um, he hobbled back, uh, he, he limped back to the uh, Virupaksha cave, which is halfway around the hill. It would have been very, very difficult. But he did that because it is because he loves all as himself. So he didn't see those hornets as other than himself. So that is true love. That is the condition where we have where we have lost ourselves in love, where we've melted in, like an iceberg melting in the ocean, we've melted in the ocean of love, which is God, which is what we actually are. 
So there is a the poem uh, Epidi Oral Why. Um, um, right, Michael, which is um, in the last verse he exemplifies with Sa Swami Sadhuvam, what you mm. just mentioned. Mm. Do you remember that verse? Um, tu neri ni tari, ta, tarubai um, and chumbara ni sahiyai. Is that the one? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're giving a pure, uh, you, you're, you, you give me a pure path. You cannot bear if I suffer. Bhagavan right. cannot bear if we suffer. That's why he wants us to return to our source. Because so long as we write his ego, suffering is inevitable. Kavalai. Ini mail kavalai. Guru Ramana. Guru Vey Ramana. Ini mail. Ini mail. Ain kavalai. Padubain Guru Vey Ramana. Why should I worry henceforth? Yes, yes. Why should yeah? Why should I have any concern about anything? So we need to surrender ourselves completely to Him. How do we surrender ourselves completely to Him? By turning within. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen, so that song is on our YouTube channel. You can check it out. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Michael. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I just wanted to thank you, Michael. This this was really you really touched my heart today. It it was really in a different level. Your explanation about the about all, love and everything. All is only Bhagavan. Bhagavan is just, even what I'm to say. It's all those words are given by Bhagavan. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Michael. Kumar, I do have a question. Ram here. Oh, um, so, uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, to the gentleman that uh, if you if you are in sync with him, he will take care of uh, everything. The question I have is uh, more of a theoretical question. I mean, the beggars on the streets and all that. So, if 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 it so happens that uh, materialistically we are totally uh, robbed off. Uh, so is that still okay? I mean, that can also happen, right? I, I mean, think. so so when surrender happens, uh, the, with that surrender attitude, we won't mind not having anything and uh, maybe, yeah. you know, become like bikers and all that. That is also kind of surrender. If we, if we are surrendered, we won't be concerned about anything. That is, we've given ourselves wholly to, to him. So uh, whatever happens sure. is according to destiny, and our destiny is selected by him. So if he wants us to experience poverty, if he wants us to experience destitution, if he wants us to experience starvation, fine, because he knows what is best. That is, we all face troubles in different forms in life. Why does Bhagavan allow us to experience these troubles? Because he, because he wants us to turn within. That is, we think the external world, the external circumstances, the things of the world are causing our happiness or unhappiness. Oh, I'm unhappy because I've got so many bills to pay. I'm unhappy because I can't pay my mortgage. I'm unhappy because I, and now I have to live begging on the street. Uh, all this is caused by our lack of surrender. If we surrender ourselves, if we give up all our likes and dislikes, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. So, Michael, I wanted to bring up one thing. My own uncle, mm -hmm. he was a very spiritual person, very yes. Uh, mother, the first in our family who, who was that spiritual, actually second in the family. My grandfather was the most spiritual. So, um, so to the point where he definitely was not focusing on a uh, career or making money or what have you, the real situation. Yeah. And he had one son. When the son has grown to age, yeah. um, where he went to college, uh, my uncle didn't have money. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, so practically speaking, 
my aunt was unhappy and uh, my uncle, uh, my, uh, uh, of course, there were physical, uh, you know, there were problems, right? So uh, I contributed to it and people contributed to it. And so the, the, my cousin came out to be pretty well. But bottom line is uh, that, that, that material uh, disenchantment he got because of spirituality, at least externally speaking, I felt led to some practical problems I could see. Yeah. So th that's where it ki I kind of struggle. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm totally in to know how to uh, reconcile the situation I saw in my life. Yeah, okay. Supposing your uncle had not been um, inclined to spirituality, supposing he wanted to um, earn a lot of money, if he, he, the fact that he didn't have money, that is his destiny. So even if he'd earned money, he would have lost it in some way. So whatever happens is according to destiny. It, it is his destiny to be, um, to not have enough money to send his son to college, but it is his son's destiny, but you and others should contribute. So all these things happen according to destiny. There are some people who really want to, to um, take care of their family, they work hard and everything, but still they remain poor. There are some people who don't care about their family at all, but they, money just comes to them, so, and their family is uh, taken care of. So everything is happening according to destiny. By our taking interest in spiritual path, we neither add to our material happiness nor detract from it. I mean, our material prosperity. What is to come to us will come to us. What is not to come to us will not come to us. What is to leave us will leave us. So it's all ultimately according to destiny. But from a worldly point of view, the worldly people will judge. Oh, because this man was uh, was um, interested in all this um, mumbo jumbo about spirituality. He didn't take care of his family, therefore he's a bad person, therefore the spirituality is not good. That's the worldly perspective, because the, 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 the worldly minded people have a limited view. Bhagavan has an unlimited view. We Sometimes very good people undergo a lot of difficulty. Very bad people seem to have everything provided. They seem to have all the comforts and conveniences of life. Life seems to go very well for them. Why is that? Because that is their destiny has been chosen by Bhagavan in such a way. Whatever destiny he chooses is what is best for us. So if he chooses for us to um, live a life of poverty, that is what is good for us. If he chooses us to live a life of normal prosperity, that is good for us. If he chooses for us to have enormous wealth, that is what is good for us. We don't know what is good for us. But if we're wise, if he chooses for us to have enormous wealth, we will give away as much as possible. Because holding on to it, that is the problem. That is the attachment. So the problem lies within ourselves, not in the outside things. There are some people who are, who are very, very rich, but they're very good-hearted. They, they, they freely give their money. There are some people who are very rich but really stingy so in fact generally people who are richer but richer they are generally the stingier they are but there are exceptions so the, the rich people who hold on to their wealth they're also holding on to a lot of things it's not good for them so the wise as Bowman says whatever is given to others is given only to oneself if this truth is known who will not give to others so if we are blessed with wealth we should share it freely for the benefit of others. Then we are benefiting. You made it very clear for me. I think uh, I got a very good explanation. Thank you so much, Michael. Right, right. So you you are actually fortunate because you were able to help your cousin. The, the fact that Bowen gave you that opportunity of helping your cousin is a blessing for you. Because if your uncle had 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 money, you wouldn't have had that opportunity to help your cousin. Yes, so you, so for sure. So you are fortunate. There is one thing, though. Uh, if, if I have food to eat, uh, it might be easier to think about spirituality is one thing I have. If I struggle for daily existence, then uh, spirituality may be 
a, a little bit of a, a far thought on my mind. I first need to get my food. So, um, so th there might be, yes, that, that, that's all. Th thanks, yeah, Michael. It, it, I appreciate it, it, it. it. That is not actually the case. It may seem to be the case from a worldly perspective, but actually, if we are genuinely spiritual, having being deprived of food will make us depend more on God. That is why, why sadhus take to a mendicant life. They, they don't know where the next meal is coming from. They are depending entirely upon God. So actually poverty is a blessing in the spiritual path. Because the more, the, the less we have, the more we have to depend on God. Got you. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. After, after the Mahabharata war was over, when Krishna asked um, uh, Kunti and the Pandavas, uh, I think it was Kunti, Kunti I think, when she, he asked them, um, uh, what boon, whatever boon you want to ask for, I will grant. She said, always keep us in trouble. Give us trouble, because when, we, when we're in trouble, we think of you. When everything is going comfortably, we forget about you. So keep us always in trouble. So sometimes the troubles that we face in life, if we are, if we are genuinely devoted, if we're genuinely on the spiritual path, the, the troubles will make us depend more and more on him. Got it, Michael. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Kumar, thank you so thank you. much for holding the satsangs. It's uh, clarifying my concepts quite a bit. I mean, I am indebted to you. You're, you're welcome. And it's all thanks, as Michael says, to Bhagwan. He arranges this. It's his satsang. He does everything. Even all this technology Bhagwan has provided. Exactly right. He puts it all together. Right. So the scientists are very useful. We, we're not, we're nothing, Bhagwan has nothing against scientists. <laughs> Michael, today I it, I feel like you are an extra dimensional being coming to us. <laughs> through I this, felt the same through this extra dimension called Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> the fourth dimension, right. transcending time wow. and space. At least space, not time. We're all in the same time. But yeah. At least we at least we can transcend space. Michael, if you I'm don't come to extent. you. If you don't come to Houston in in physical form, I'm gonna go and visit you in London. <laughs> That's all unnecessary now, because Bhagwan <laughs> has dissolved all these differences of of space. Space, yeah. <laughs> ah. Thank you so, so much. So, even this little remove that is this partial removal of the limitation of space. Is so nice for us when Bhagwan completely frees us from time and space. How nice it will be! <laughs> and he gives us a sample of that every day in sleep, a state without time or space. Uh, excuse me, I have a question to uh, Michael James yes. uh, the, regarding this uh, uh, panpsychism. Yes. So, since everything is conscious, only only what exists is consciousness. Then they should uh, they, we have to accept panpsychism also, right? Not ne no, because they think there is that is their understanding of consciousness is something different. They think that consciousness is highly developed in a human organism. It's, it's in a more basic form in other um, things. But they, that is panpsychism, they still believe in the existence of a physical world. According to the Bhagavan, physical world is just an appearance. It appears in the mind. And the mind appears in consciousness. Mind is illumined by consciousness. So what Bhagavan has taught us is something far, far deeper. Ultimately, there is no world at all. There are, no, there are no material things. There are no forms, no objects, no phenomena. They all seem to exist only in the view of ego, the subject. And if ego and subject investigates itself, if, 
it will dissolve back into its source and all phenomena will dissolve along with it. Yes, actually, all different created objects, including all plants and everything, has the, has the limited accessibility to the consciousness. So, so, the, they, the con they are not conscious, they are jada. That is, according to Bhagavan, all phenomena, all objects, all forms are jada. What is jada has no existence of its own. It doesn't actually exist. It, jada things seem to exist only in the view of ego. So no material thing is conscious. Now we take our, we, because we take ourselves to be this body, we think this body is conscious. But Bhagavan said the body, all the five sheets are jada. The, the physical form, the prana, the mind, the intellect, the will, all are jada. Because they're all objects perceived by us. Yeah, yeah. But even that, even some. That you is, know, they are all appearances in the mind, which is in consciousness. The mind itself is an appearance in consciousness. Yeah. But the mind appears only in its own view, not in the view of consciousness. In the view of pure consciousness, it alone exists. There is no names or forms. So in case of plants, uh, they, have, they seem to have limited consciousness, right? Plants. Yeah, forget, now, now you're looking outwards. When you're looking outwards, you can't find consciousness. Now you're, you, um, you are now aware of yourself as a body. So it seems to you that your body is conscious. So you assume other people are conscious and you will, plants also maybe have some consciousness, but the body is not conscious. See, consider in a dream. In a dream, you experience yourself as a person. You see so many other people. You assume that all those other people are conscious. And you may also ask questions, are the plants conscious or not? That all may seem relevant while you're dreaming. But when you wake up, what do you realize? All that was your own mental creation. None of the people you saw in your dream were conscious, not even the person you took yourself to be. What was conscious it's only the dreamer. The dreamer is you. So because yeah. the dreamer mistakes itself to be a person, it feels this person is conscious. Therefore, it feels all other people are conscious. No thing is conscious. That yeah. is, no object is conscious. All objects are jada and dasat. Mm -hmm. What is conscious is only I am. Ego seems to be conscious because it is a mixture of I am and objects, which, and objects. adjuncts, which are all jada. So it's a mixture. That's why it's called chit jada granti. It is the knot that links the chit and the jada. Okay, thank you, Michael. <laughs> thank you, Michael. So, so all, these, all these philosophies like panpsychism, all these arise because of looking outwards. The fundamental mistake yeah, sure. we all make is looking outwards. We mm -hmm. cannot find consciousness outside. Outside we see only objects. Consciousness is not an object. Consciousness is that to which all objects appear. So consciousness can never be an object. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, I, I totally accept that the consciousness uh, only uh, exists. The con only consciousness can uh, feel every anything. Yeah. All, only everything else is just yeah. an appearance in consciousness. Appearance, yeah, that's true. Yeah. 